You are a human. At least I hope so. You are part of the Kingdom Animalia. You are a mammal, a primate, and in the genus Homo. Specifically a very wise Homo. Anatomically modern humans have been walking this earth for around 200,000 years. And since then, after leaving the plains of Africa, have settled nearly every part of the planet. We then discovered agriculture, began building settlements, began to write, then fast forward some thousand years and BAM! We are here in the modern world. It is pretty crazy how much humans have changed since we first split off from our chimp ancestors 6 million years ago. And you might be wondering, how we will change in the near and distant future? Well, that's what we are going to look at today. How will humans evolve in the future? Or just anything that's not this. Or this. But please just stop. To begin looking at the future of humanity, it'll be good to know how we got here in the first place. Why did we evolve this way anyway? Let's look at that then, shall we? Humans began splitting off from our chimp ancestors around 6 million years ago, with our last common ancestor with chimpanzees being the Australopithecus. Around that time, a major climatic change was happening. The rich rainforests of Africa began to disappear, which gave way to more open spaces. The species then began to diverge. Some of the population still lived in the trees, but later died out due to further climate change and the shortage of resources. However, some of the population moved out of the trees and into the open plains. The plains were far more dangerous. There were new predators, new landscapes, and new food sources. This is when our brain began to have its first growth spurt. If you weren't intelligent enough to survive in the new environment, you simply died off before you could reproduce. This is called natural selection. Before recently, we had believed that the growth of our brain was of a gradual and linear one. But recent observations suggest that the brain only grew in certain time segments, which were closely linked to climate change events. It is believed that there were around three of them. Humans, like other primates and mammals, have complex social groups. It is speculated that one of the reasons for us having a large brain size is because of our complicated social connections. A study done on chimps has found a correlation between brain size and the size of the social group. The Tamara monkeys were found to have a brain size ratio of 2.3 and an average social group size of 5, while the macaque monkeys had an average brain size ratio of 3.8 and had a social group size of 50. Judging by our brain size ratio, it is hypothesized that our social groups are around 150, or what is called a clan. This, coupled with our intelligence, is probably what made us so successful as a species. Our efficient sharing of information via language, and the ability of abstract thought and culture, is the reason you are sitting here watching this today. The earliest humans were herbivores, relying mostly on fruits, seeds, and sometimes even insects. But this all changed when humans acquired their taste for blood and became omnivores. It all started off 2 million years ago when humans began scavenging leftover corpses left behind by other carnivores. What first was merely scavenging, then turned into attacking small animals and rodents, and eventually to the hunting of large game. But there is one issue. Humans are weak, don't run very fast, and at first they don't have spears and arrows. So how did they do it? How did such measly creatures manage to take down deer and other animals? Well here's the catch. Humans may not be very fast runners, but in the long run, we can outrun pretty much every animal on this planet. Ever wondered how humans can run marathons? 42 kilometers that is. It is no coincidence, humans are built for running. This is because, instead of chasing down prey purely by speed, early humans used something called persistence hunting. In other words, humans basically ran down their prey until it dropped dead of exhaustion. This ancient technique is also still being used by the African Bushmen. If that isn't badass, then I don't know what is. Humans are naturally designed to be the best long distance runners there are. How? Let's run through some of our adaptations. One of the adaptations is the general body size of the humans. Unlike chimps who are short and stocky, humans have a taller and thinner body. We are also more bottom heavy than chimps, meaning that we tend to have more muscles in our legs than our upper body. Specifically our gluteus maximus, or in other words the butt, stabilizes us whilst we run. Another adaptation is that we are bipedal. At first, it may sound like a disadvantage since we use less limbs to move, but actually, it proves to be an advantage. The fact that our chest cavity doesn't thrust into the ground with every stride means that we can regulate our breathing much better. And the final major adaptation is the runner's high. If you run regularly, you'll be familiar with the amazing feeling after a long run, and it's not there for no reason. This is a reward system that our brain gives to motivate us to chase down our prey. This trait is only found in humans and other long distance animals such as wolves. So what's so special about this meat? Is it really that important that we risked our lives hunting it? Well, studies have shown that it played a very major role in our evolution. You see, being a herbivore takes up a lot of energy via the digestive system. All those tough roots and cellulose require lots more energy to digest than meat, especially cooked meats. 
Once we started shifting our diet towards meat, our stomachs shrank so more energy could be diverted towards our brains and not to our intestines. And believe me, the brain is very energy hungry. In fact, it uses 20% of all the body's energy, more than any other organ. Meat is also more nutritious. All those fats and proteins, and especially nicotinamide, which is a form of vitamin B, helps to fuel our brain resulting with an increase in size. All of this happened millions of years ago, but there have also been traits that have evolved only recently in humanity, such as blue eyes and the ability to digest milk as an adult, which evolved as recently as 10,000 years ago when humans began to venture north and herd cattle. This can be used as evidence that humanity is still evolving. So, now you know all about how humans got to where they are now, but the question is, where will we go next? Are we even still evolving at all? Let's begin to answer this. There are three possible outcomes for the future of human evolution. One, we will still evolve naturally via natural selection. Two, we have stopped evolving completely. And three, we will evolve via genetic engineering. Let's start off with the natural way. One of the most likely traits that we will gain is the immunity to certain diseases. This is already happening. Populations living in malaria prone environments have shown to have an adaptation in the genome that protects them from malaria. This is because of the sickle cell mutation. This mutation normally would be very harmful since it does not create red blood cells properly, giving them a sickle shape. However, this deformed shape means that the malaria parasites cannot inject itself into the cell, thus protecting the person from the disease. Alas, there is nothing to say that the malaria will not adapt itself to then attack their new red blood cells. The fight between organism and disease is a constant one. Another possible evolution is the absence of races. Globalization means that we can now travel freely to almost any part of the planet. This rapid movement of people increases the chances of interracial marriage. With mixed race babies on the rise, it will not be surprising if in a couple hundred years, the line between races blurs completely. Another trend that has been going on in humanity is our increase in heights. Over the past 100 years, humans have had a significant increase in our average heights. Some say that this is because of mate selection. That is, people prefer to mate with taller people resulting in taller babies. But some speculate that this is only because of a sudden abundance of food and healthcare and that the trend will soon slow down. One of the most potent factors in natural selection is child mortality. If one simply does not live to adult age to reproduce, they will not pass on their genes. For example, a hundred years ago, if a woman's hips were far too narrow, the baby would not be able to pass through, resulting in the death of both the mother and the child. We can then predict that in the future, women may be shorter and have wider hips as studies suggest they have more children than others. However, procedures like C-sections can interfere with this process, resulting in all kinds of women being able to have kids. But probably one of the most influential forms of selection is mate selection. Mate selection is the process of an organism choosing its mate to reproduce based on their tastes. This has become really prevalent in humans recently. In fact, monogamy, which is when partner is also one partner, is a relatively new thing, since evidence suggests that early humans mostly practiced polygamy. So, with a population of 7 billion and humans choosier than ever, this makes for the perfect recipe for serious mate selection, Instead of nature doing the choosing for us, we can choose ourselves who we will procreate with. This will likely result with the much more intelligent and attractive human beings in the future. The future of humanity, in other words, is who we choose to mate with. All of this could happen if we assume that we are still evolving, which some people think we are not. This is mostly because of the fact that we are technically eliminating natural selection through technology and science. People who would otherwise die a thousand years ago can now live up into old age. If you had short-sightedness a hundred thousand years ago, you would likely not survive long, but in today's age, these people can now wear glasses and easily pass on their genes. This is part of the reason why some people think that we are degenerating as a species. I'm going to refrain from using the word de-evolution, since it doesn't exist, and for it to exist, it would mean there is some kind of goal to evolution. Since there is no natural filter selecting which genes can be passed on, it can result in accumulation of negative mutations. For example, traits like myopia are on the rise, infertility is on the rise, I could go on. So, how do we solve this? Will we continue to degenerate as a species? Well, there is hope, and that is genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is the direct manipulation of DNA to alter an organism's characteristics. This wonderful science could be the remedy to a whole load of genetic illnesses. And the great thing about it is that if you remove a gene from one person, that person then has less of a chance of passing it on to his kids. Instead of buying glasses for every child that has myopia, we can remove the gene from multiple of children, which will then prevent it from being passed on, with the hope that eventually the gene is cleared from our genome. But there is one problem with genetic engineering, and that is that it is very expensive and difficult. Until now. 
meets CRISPR. These guys were basically made genetic engineering cheaper and easier overnight. This is how it works. There are viruses called bacteriophages, which specifically attack bacteria. Most of the time the bacterium will die if it got attacked, but now and again the bacterium survives. This is where CRISPR begins to work its magic. The bacterium saves a chunk of the virus DNA and saves in an archive within. If the bacterium gets attacked again, a protein called Cas9 compares every bit of DNA with the DNA chunk saved in the archive, and once it found a perfect match, it cuts out the virus completely. It's sort of like vaccination, but even better. The thing to note here is how precise the Cas9 protein is. It is also programmable. This means they tell it what you need to add, swap and remove, and it will do it at the position of a surgeon. The hope for this technique is that we might one day use it to completely eliminate hereditary diseases. Not only that, but it can also remove viruses, hiding in your own cell's DNA. When injected into HIV infected rats, it's resulted in almost 50% of the virus being removed. It could also be possible to use to slow down and stop aging, by editing the parts of the alleles that break down with age. However, it is not all sunshine and rainbows. Taking evolution into our own hands can be a very risky action. This could lead to the first instances of what are called designer babies. Why stop at eliminating diseases? Why not make your child more intelligent, more attractive? The list goes on. If everyone wants their child to be as genetically superior as possible, it could lead to a lack of variation, which can result with a virus wiping out a population almost instantly. It could also lead to gender selection, resulting in an imbalance between males and females. It is probable that first, only the rich will be able to afford to genetically edit their offspring. This could lead to a class divide between engineered children and natural children. Natural children may one day be seen as inferior scum that should be sterilized. But well, let's hope regulation will be put in place to prevent that. So, humans have come a long way, starting off as simple primates to possibly genetically engineered gods. But to remember to take all of this with a grain of salt, the future is a very hard thing to predict, especially evolution, as there are far too many factors to consider. So instead, we can merely guesstimate. I hope that you have enjoyed this video, since it is a bit longer than usual. Remember to like, subscribe and hit the bell button. So with all that, peace out.